Bapak Ibu dan rekan-rekan sekalian, uh, acara akan kita segera mulai. Kami mohon agar Bapak Ibu dan rekan-rekan sekalian yang ke, uh, posisi handphone ataupun kom komputernya masih belum mute atau silent, kami mohon untuk di mute dulu atau di silent dulu. Ladies and gentlemen, as we are about to begin, we would like to remind you that this meeting is being recorded and some attendees are participating by video conference. So please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi. Have a very good morning to all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted to warmly welcome you to the massive open online course or MOOC of Nutrition Care Process on Kidney Disease, a case-based learning, which is held today by the Department of Nutrition and Health of the Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing, Universitas Gajah Mada. My name is Umi Salama. I'm honored to be your Master of Ceremony today, who will guide you through our program today. It is an honor to us to welcome distinguished head and secretary of the Department of Nutrition and Health, the Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing, Universitas Gajah Mada, distinguished staff and lecturers from the Department of Nutrition and Health of the Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing, Universitas Gajah Mada, Honorable Speaker, Dr. Zulfitri Azwan Daud, RDN, from the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics, Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, University Putra Malaysia. And also we welcome all the dietetic internship students and participants of the event. Yang kami hormati, Ketua Departemen dan Sekretaris Departemen Gizi Kesehatan, Fakultas Kedokteran Kesehatan Masyarakat dan Keperawatan Universitas Gajah Mada, seluruh dosen Departemen Gizi Kesehatan, Fakultas Kedokteran Kesehatan Masyarakat dan Keperawatan Universitas Gajah Mada, narasumber kami Dr. Zulfitri Azwan Maddaud RDN dari Universiti Putra Malaysia dan seluruh mahasiswa Prodi Profesi Dietitian serta seluruh peserta MOOC pada hari ini. Kami mengucapkan terima kasih dan selamat datang kepada Bapak-Ibu sekalian pada hari ini, pada acara MOOC Asuhan Gizi pada Penyakit Ginjal Berbasis Studi Kasus. Ladies and gentlemen, let me first of all introduce you to the agenda in the opening ceremony session. There will be speeches from the head of the Department of Nutrition and Health of the Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing, Universitas Gajah Mada. It will be followed by the presentations of our guest lecturer, Dr. Zulfitri Azwan Matjaud, RDN. And then the program will be followed by discussion sessions. And uh, after what the discussion shall take place, this whole program will be summed up by photo session. Bapak Ibu, agenda kita pada hari ini akan dimulai dengan uh, pembukaan nanti yang akan disampaikan oleh Ketua Departemen Gizi Kesehatan Fakultas Kedokteran Kesehatan Masyarakat dan Keperawatan Universitas Gajah Mada sekaligus dosen koordinator dari uh, MOC pada hari ini Asuhan Gizi pada penyakit ginjal berbasis studi kasus. Kemudian akan dilanjutkan presentasi dari dosen tamu kita dari Universiti Putra Malaysia 
Dr. Zulfitri Azwan Matdaud. Kemudian setelah itu kita akan ada sesi diskusi dan kemudian penutup yang akan ditutup dengan foto bersama. Bapak Ibu, ladies and gentlemen, to officially open or start this program, may we kindly invite the head of the Department of Nutrition and Health of the Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing, Universitas Gajah Mada, to give a welcome speech to Dr. Susetiwati, please. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Salam sehat. Dia the Honorable Guest Lecturer Dr. Sultitri Aswan Maddaw, RPM, Dedetic Intensive Student from all of our Indonesia and all attendees. Thank you for being here today at this wonderful opportunity. I'm Dr. Susetiawati. It is such a pleasure for me to greet you a warm welcome on behalf of Department of Nutrition and Health, University Gajah Mada, as the organizer of the massive open online course on nutrition care process in kidney disease. Today is the second session of our MOOC, and we have a special session as it is open not only for MOOC participants, but also clinical nutritionists and dietitian practitioners in Indonesia. Uh, as we know, data from Indonesian baseline health research 2018, the prevalence chronic kidney disease in Indonesia is about 3.8 per mil. The number are increasing from the previous survey in 2013. Besides that, the prevalence of protein energy wasting for maintenance dialysis patient was very high in worldwide. This is a challenge for us dietitians to give our best effort in this field to intervene chronic kidney disease. Hence, making ourselves keep updated on the current guideline and research is a good start to give evidence-based intervention. This opportunity will be beneficial for both students and practitioners to learn and maybe to be exposed to a new perspective of nutrition intervention on GKD. Before we get started, I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Sulfitri Aswan Matdal, RDN PhD, from University Putra, Malaysia, as our guest lecturer in this session, who will deliver about medical nutrition therapy on chronic kidney disease. Dr. Sulfitri ini sangat expert di bidang ginjal dan beberapa peserta sudah berapa kali ketemu di Kuala Lumpur Dr. Sulfitri di acara Nutrition Kidney Foundation terakhir di 2018 saya ke Kuala Lumpur mengikuti seminar dengan Dr. Sulfitri uh, I hope today will be a good start for other opportunities in the future hereafter I would like to appreciate the committee for the hard work on preparing for the MOOC, as well as all of the attendees from the students and practitioners for the enthusiasm to pursue knowledge regarding these topics. Let's start the session. I would like to say once more on behalf of this MOOC organizer. Welcome. It is great to see so many of you here. Saya akhiri dengan patun penutup menanam padi selalu di sawah, meski ada banyak hamanya. Andai ada tutur kata yang salah, mohon maaf yang sebesar-besarnya. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the wonderful remark, Dr. Sosetewati. Uh, we shall proceed this event with the presentations by the guest lecturer. We are privileged to have Dr. Sulvitri Azwan Madaud, RDN, from the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics, Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, University Mutra Malaysia. The session will be moderated by Ms. Yosepin Anandati Pranoto, MSRD. Ms. Anandati is now the lecturer of the Department of Nutrition and Health, Universitas Gajah Mada. She had her bachelor degree from the Universitas Gajah Mada and master degree from Kent State University. Ms. Anandati, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ma Umi. Um, good morning. 
and greetings to our participants and our guest lecturer, Dr. Zulfitri, and also Dr. Susutiawati as the head of Department of Nutrition and Health, and also all the committee from Universitas Gajah Mada. So today is a wonderful joint event between Universitas Gajah Mada or UGM and University Putra Malaysia or UPM. This guest lecture is a part of a massive open online course or MOOC for dietetic internship students to deepen our understanding about MNT or medical nutrition therapy for chronic kidney disease. Okay, now let me briefly introduce our distinguished guest lecturer for today. Nadira, can you um, share screen Dr. Zulfitri's short CV? Okay, I think there's some technical issues from our committee. I will um, share screen from my side. Apologize for the delay. Okay, so our guest lecturer today, Dr. Zulfitri, um, background education, he, he got her master's and PhD degree, both master's and PhD degree from Wayne State University, Detroit, Michigan, USA. Uh, right now, he is a council on renal nutrition at National Kidney Foundation in the USA, and also hold credential from, uh, from the... Academy of Nutrition and Dietetic USA as a registered dietitian nutritionist commission. His recent publication and research um, are theme and titled as Exploring the Experience and Perceptions of Hemodiala Hemodialysis Patients, Observing Ramadan Fasting, a qualitative study published in 2021. The second one is clinical malnutrition predictive model among gynecology cancer patients prior to elective operation. Those are two of his most recent publication. And right now, let's hear the presentation for the next 75 minutes from Dr. Zulvitri. Dr. Zulvitri, do you need any assistance for the slides? Okay, uh, I think I can, I can do it. Let me share okay. the slides. All right. Okay, so Dr. Zubitri, please, the time is yours. Okay. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And uh, very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank here uh, Dr. Suzette Iwati for inviting me uh, to share with my fellow dietitians and future dietitians uh, in Indonesia. Yeah, pertaining to MNT for CKD. And uh, I have to congratulate uh, UGM for organizing these uh, wonderful uh, MOOC courses yeah? and sharing between uh, resources between universities. Okay. So uh, basically, this, this is my lecture online, uh, out, sorry, uh, lecture outline. So basically, I am going to talk on the reference that I actually heavily use for my presentation. And then we're gonna um, touch a little bit about uh, CKD, uh, just, just uh, to recap here, uh, the cause etiology, how we diagnose CKD, uh, and then um, in terms of the nutrition aspect, what are the aspects of how a nutrition impacted, uh, how CKD impacted nutrition, right? And then we're gonna talk about uh, hemodiasis, the as a one of the treatment modality when the patient advance to the, um, End stage kidney disease, peritoneal dialysis, and maybe I touch a little bit about AKI. And then uh, the primary focus of this presentation is the MNT for each of these conditions and also treatment modality, right? 
Okay, so uh, the learning outcome that I expect our future students to to uh, come out with at the end of this lecture is that um, this, the, the, the intern should at least uh, be able to relate, you know, the function, uh, the pathophysiology, the, the hormonal function of the kidney and so on, yeah. Uh, and then demonstrate the pertinent nutrition assessment skill. I guess the second objective, we can achieve it later uh, when you have uh, a second session uh, next week in which we, it's going to be more practical uh, session based on the case. And then, um, and of course, we have to apply the medical nutrient therapy for various stages of the CKD and also various treatment modality, yeah, whether it's a dialysis, a transplantation, and so on. Okay, so I would like to go with the big picture first, right? Uh, when we talk about MNT for renal diseases, yeah, we have to understand, we have to understand um, the structure and function of the kidney first. Why? Why we need to understand this is because um, as a dietitian, we got to explain to our, our, our uh, patients later on, yeah, how are their conditions is affecting the nutrition status and so on. So having said that, we have to understand the function of kidney in terms of hormonal function, homeostasis function, excretion function, and of course, uh, slightly on the anatomy aspect, on the structure of the kidney per se. And I hope this has already been covered yeah, uh, in your syllabus before. And um, when we talk about uh, chronic kidney disease or kidney disease, of course, we have to understand also from the med medical perspective, what will be the diagnosis that the doctors are using to identify whether one patient has a kidney disease or not? Yeah, and um, and then uh, we going to be uh, zooming in into our expertise, which is the, which is the nutrition. Yeah, uh, pertaining to the CKD, and then uh, once the patient of the CKD progress toward end stage kidney disease, sorry about it. Uh, so. Uh, they have to undergo renal replacement therapy. There are several renal replacement therapy available, such as hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, kidney transplantation, and so on. So we also need to understand the nutrition approach for each of these treatment modalities. Okay, for other type of renal disorders such as uh, glomerular disease, kidney stone, and also some AKI aspect, I won't be able to be covered in this a uh, very short uh, period time yeah so i'll be focusing on the chronic kidney disease right so these are some common acronym that i'll be using uh, throughout this uh, presentation uh, i would love to have this presentation as a two-way presentation meaning that you can always stop me uh, anytime if you don't know if you don't um uh understand uh any of the term that i'm using feel free to stop me all right Okay, okay. So these are uh, some of the references that I'm heavily used uh, for this uh, lecture. Yeah. Uh, so my primary reference is based on the recent guideline published by KDOQI, or I call it KDOQ if you don't mind, right? So this was uh, published in 2020. The first guideline was actually published in the year of 2000. It's very long years. Yeah, it's been 20 years ago, right? So they have updated the guideline. So uh, most of the current reference are actually uh, looking at this, yeah? And then I'm also looking into the KDGO uh, guideline as well. And then also MNT for chronic kidney disease that was published by Malaysian Dietitian Association. But uh, this was published in 2005. And um, bear in mind that Many of the content though is also heavily borrowed from KDOKI uh, guideline. Yeah. So, and then uh, this was actually outdated already, but some of it I'm going to use it. And also, not to forget, also uh, from the NKF in the US, they have this one pocket guide for to nutrition assessment for patients with uh, kidney disease. So, um, this one is also I'm going to use it. And I'm also comparing to some of the guidelines that in my fellow Indonesian, you have it, uh, such, as, such as you have a uh, consensus nutrition by the Penyakit Ninja Chronic, was uh, published in 2011. 
and I have also looked in, into the guideline. Uh, it's basically very much, um, you know, uh, very much uh, taken it from uh, the, the KDOK guideline, the original KDOK guideline based on the year 2000. So it's already uh, also uh, pretty outdated. Okay. All right, so these are some of educational resources that we as a dietitians that we can actually use this here. Yeah? If I have time today, I can uh, show to you some of this uh, in how we can educate our patient, right? Um, uh, this is one of the book that specifically targeted on the phosphate aspect, phosphate uh, guide to the patient. And also this is the app that I have uh, developed uh, for our kidney patient. And uh, I'm not going to go into details uh, about, you know, the uh, function, the basic things about kidney. Uh, so you can always uh, go back to some of these uh, excellent resources from the YouTube. Yeah, uh, you can learn and recap about it. Uh, right. So let us just recap. Yeah, let us just recap. Maybe I would like to have this uh, session as interactive. Let me see, wait here. Give me a second. Uh, okay. Can you can you see on your screen uh, on the Mentimeter? Can you see it? Yes. Yes, okay. Or if you don't have it, uh, you can actually go to the browser. You can go to your uh, web browser and then you type www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And then uh, you are going to key in the codes here, 5025-6593. Right? Okay. okay, so you're going to key in this code 5025-6593, okay? Um, just put some reaction to this if you can, Let, because we just want to try whether uh, this thing is work. Uh, I have uh, several questions in Menti. Yes, it looks like it works. Some of you already put thumbs up. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. Mm, okay. Interesting. Some of you uh, put this uh, cat symbol. All right. Okay, perfect. That's mean it's work. All right. So. Okay, that means work. Okay, fine. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing for a bit. Okay, uh, I'm going to move to, uh, you know, uh, my next quiz, James. Okay, may I know, just a bit around, where are you guys from? Okay. All right. 
So I can see that uh, majority are from uh, York, Yogyakarta, I believe. Yeah, some are coming from uh, West Java. Yeah, uh, and there are also uh, some audience coming from South Sulawesi, uh, Rio Islands, and so on. All right, very good, very good. Okay, all right. So I have more serious question now. Okay. Uh, so, can you uh, describe the most important role of the kidney? What is the most important role of the kidney? Just a couple of words to describe about it. Okay. Fluid balancing, okay, all right, good. By filtrations, all right, basically on filtration aspect. Okay, electrolyte balance, all right. Metabolic secretion, okay. What do you mean by metabolic secretion? You mean on the hormonal function, isn't it? Okay. Right, okay. Fit homeostasis, all right, okay, balanced foods. So, hormonal function, urine production, electrolyte balance, okay. Seems like uh, the audience already got uh, some uh, very good uh, understanding about the uh, kidney roles, right? So I'm just going to stop it, right? Um, so let me share the screen again. So this is the, as a recap on the function of the kidney. Uh, most of you are correct. Yeah, it's important our fruit balance to maintain the osmality. Electrolyte balance, that's very important. Uh, aspect of the, the uh, kidney function yeah if there is in in uh, uh if there are electrolyte imbalance so there are huge things there are complications that are gonna affect particularly on the heart muscle and so on yeah acid base balance and metabolism of the calcium phosphate uh in order to maintain a good bone status that is also being played by the kidney by the kidney yeah uh, and kidney also exhibit endocrine function and um, also most importantly uh, on the elimination of the waste. So those are the six main key functions of the kidney, right? All right, so as introduction about chronic kidney disease, right? Um, you want to go through what are the some of the causes of, of CKD? Right, not causes or causes of CKD. Yeah, uh, one of the major causes of CKD in Malaysia setting is actually diabetes. Diabetes represent, in fact, uh, when we look into our end stage kidney disease patient, more than fifty percent of our patients are actually had diabetes. Yeah, they they got CKD. They got um yeah CKD because of diabetes. And then second most important aspect is hypertension. And I believe in Indonesia is also the scenario is a little bit also the same, but uh, the prevalence of, of uh, people with ESKD present with diabetes is not as high as in Malaysia, right? And some other causes of uh, CKD include uh, autoimmune disease, such as uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE. Some infection could also cause it. And of course, the, the uh, usage of overusage or overuse or misuse of drugs, yes, yeah, such as uh, analgesic can also uh, cause uh, CKD, right? So um, what is um, aspect that we use to diagnose and classify uh, the CKD, all right? So we use a markers of kidney damage, yeah? Uh, so basically, uh, the doctors will look into the presence of protein in the urine, for example, qualitatively and also quantitatively. 
yeah, uh, microalbuminuria, the presence of albumin. Supposedly, protein is a big molecule, so it's supposed not to be excreted by the kidney. So if the protein is actually found in the kidney, there's something wrong there uh, with the kidney. Yeah, uh, and then uh, on top of that, uh, of course, there are some other uh, tests that they're using, such as looking into the shape, structure of the kidney using ultrasound and so on. So those are some of the tests that the doctors or nephrologists are actually testing uh, to identify whether someone has kidney disease or not. Okay. So how do we identify or classify those with CKD? There are several stages, yes, stage one until stage five of CKD. So we use uh, what we call as estimated glomerular filtration rate. Yeah, uh, there are several formula that are available uh, on the net uh, that are actually using it. So the most recent one that um, more commonly being used right now is a CKD API formula. You can actually go and click there uh, to actually calculate it. What information you need is that uh, you're going to put a key in the age of the patient. Yeah, uh, you're going to key in uh, their serum creatinine level of the patient. Yeah, and of course there are some adjustment whether the patient is male, female, and so on. Right, so from there you will be able to calculate the EGFR, right? So based on the EGFR, we can then further classify CKD patient based on this. Yeah, if the EGFR is less than uh, fifteen ml, yeah, uh, per minute, so this one is considered as a stage five CKD patient. Yeah, we call it CKD five. Yeah. Uh, but if the uh, GFR is between 45 to 59, that is a CKD3, yeah, CKD3A, okay? So uh, this is also, uh, in tally, they're also looking uh, in comparison to the presence of the albumin as well. Yeah, the present, for example, the present uh, with the reduced number of GFR, plus the presence of albumin, you know, uh, for example, more than 25, this is uh, considered as a very high risk. Yeah, and it's considered bad, yeah, uh, toward the progression of CKD. So let's see the magnitude of CKD worldwide. Yeah, in 2007, it has been reported that 1.2 million people actually died from uh, CKD, yeah. And the prevalence is, you know, uh, in worldwide has been increasing tremendously as presented by uh, Dr. Suze uh, uh, just now. Uh, how Indonesia as well as also seeing uh, increasing trend in the prevalence of uh, CKD overall. Yeah. So uh, when we look into uh, geographic variation, there are some differences from one country to another. Yeah in which some other country have much uh, high prevalence in Malaysia, for example, we are having quite a significant uh, high numbers of people uh, having uh, CKD or ESRID actually. Yeah. So uh, in our country, um, there are over 250 uh, per million population in a year having uh, suffered from ESRID. So let's uh, take a look. Once the patient is having CKD, what are the complications that they're gonna have? Yeah, uh, and this is actually reflecting back to the function of the kidney. So if you understand the function of kidney, you can actually relate what what will be the complication of the CKD. For example, uh, you know that one of the important aspect of kidney is to uh, preserve the electrolyte balance. Okay. So if the kidney is affected, yeah, if, um, so of course the patient will have issues with uh, balancing between the sodium and water, and then this will actually lead to the hypertension, yeah, uh, increase in the uh, fluid uh, overload, over, overload, yeah, and then of course uh, will make the heart to um, work harder, yeah, become um, and end up with heart failure, yeah. And so on, so forth. There are a lot of uh, 
issues or complication uh, pertaining to the CKD. And all of these actually relate back to the basic of the kidney function, right? As you can see here, as the patient progress toward the end stage of CKD, uh, they started to exhibit many complications. For example, when they progress up to the stage four of CKD, you can see that many of our patients started to exhibit having hypertension, having hyperthyroid, they're also having anemia, uh, their the phosphorus become elevated, you know, and also in terms of their uh, strength, they also have failed the quarter mile walk, yeah. And then um, when you look into the serum albumin, they're having hypoalbuminemia, right? So all of these uh, become uh, more and more complication arise when the patient, once the patient progress toward end stage of kidney disease, right? It's the same thing here. As you can see that this one is age standardized rate of cardiovascular event, meaning make, uh, they, if they get heart attack and so on. The cardiovascular event is also uh, increased. The relative risk is increased as the patient progress toward end stage of kidney disease, right? So let's take a look uh, and zoom in as uh, we are expert in nutrition. So the impact of advanced CKD on nutrition, right? So, so these are some of the impact, yeah? Uh, actually, we have published uh, this paper in uh, Nutrient, sorry, in Nutrient in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, yeah? We uh, do some review about the etiology of malnutrition in CKD. If you're interested, you can actually read further. But the key words that I want to emphasize here is that yeah, malnutrition in CKD is slightly different than the malnutrition in other population. Yeah, so basically there are two different uh, two different reason why this patient developed malnutrition. The first one is the dialysis-induced iatrogenic factors for malnutrition. Among patients with CKD5D, when I say CKD5D, meaning that the patient is already reached end-stage kidney disease, which is CKD5, and then D is actually referring to the treatment modality, which is dialysis, yeah, CKD5D. So when a patient is uh, reaching CKD5D, meaning that they are on treatment dialysis, uh, dialysis treatment, so there are medical factors that also contributing for development of malnutrition syndrome in this patient. Yeah? For example, um, the type of dialyzer that we are actually using. So if you can see here, this is dialyzer. Yeah? The type of dialyzer that we uh, are using can also uh, you know, uh, impact uh, the patient in the sense that it's create um, what we call as um, inflammation. Yeah, and then um, the dialysis factors such as you know dialysis adequacy, whether the patient has been dialyzed adequately to excrete all those waste material. Yeah, and then maybe the inflammation on the excess side. Yeah, um, the type of dialyzer membrane that they're using, and in fact, when the patient uh, on dialysis, they lost a lot of nutrients, yeah? particularly on amino acid and some protein during the, the process. All of these is one of the factors, some of the factors that actually contribute to malnutrition in CKD patient. So this is called as dialysis induced iotrogenic factors, yeah? And then on the other hand, we also have the nutrition factors that contributing to malnutrition, just like in, in, in any other condition, yeah? Uh, for example, um, the process of um, inflammation per se can trigger a cascade of, uh, of a reaction in which leading to the poor appetite. Yeah? As the patient is uh, having poor appetite, so of course, the overall energy intake and also protein intake will be affected as well. And some of the residual toxin that are not being excreted completely you know, during dialysis process, for example, lead to the alteration in taste, yeah? Of course, when uh, we feel like a bitter taste and so on, that will also affect the appetite and everything and eventually will impact the uh, uh, 
nutrition aspect. Okay. So that is all is called as the non iatrogenic factors of malnutrition, right? So um, the etiology of malnutrition, as I can say, in CKD patients is very unique. In 2008, Folk et al. actually published, this is based on the International Society of Renal Nutrition and Metabolism, yeah, ISRNM. They published some criteria to define or to diagnose protein energy wasting in CKD population. So what is protein energy wasting? This is term that all of you dietitians should be uh, using because it's a very common term uh, being referred to CKD population. Yeah, um, is a state of nutritional and metabolic derangement in patient with CKD. Yeah, uh, and it's being characterized by loss of systematic body protein and energy store, and as a result, this lead to the muscle loss, fat mass, and also cakes, yeah. So ISRM proposed four different criteria based on the biochemical indicators, such as albumin, based on the body weight, yeah, and also based on the decreased fat mass, and also based on the energy intake, and also protein intake from the dietary intake. Yeah, so there are four uh, different criteria. If the patient fulfill three of these criteria, so that patient is can be diagnosed as having PEW, protein energy wasting. So let's take a look into the prevalence of uh, protein energy wasting worldwide. As highlighted by uh, Dr. Susan Yowati just now, you know, the prevalence of uh, protein energy wasting is huge. And in fact, in Southeast Asia, particularly in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand, after they pull in the data from all these uh, three countries, they found that about half of our advanced CKD patient is actually having a PEW. So it's actually a very serious condition affecting a CKD population, yeah? So uh, what are the impact of this, uh, uh, how, how, and this process, how PEW impacting CKD, yeah? How, how PEW actually develop in CKD population is, uh, a very uh, complicated process. Yeah, based on these figures, you can see that there are many family factors that are actually contributing to this uh, PEW. As I highlighted just now, it's not just about nutrition factors. It's not just about eating inadequately, but there are also medical factors that are actually contributing to PEW, right? All right, so we have covered uh, pretty much on this. We have recap on the um, kidney structure and function, yeah? And we also have talked about how we diagnose and how we classify CKD patient, right? So now we are going to move on to the treatment modality. Once the patient is arriving at the CKD5, for example, with a significant sign and symptom of uremia, so they have to undergo certain type of treatment. This type of treatment is known as renal replacement therapy in order to sustain their life, right? So the most common uh, renal replacement therapy in Malaysia and also Indonesia is uh, hemodialysis, yeah? So what is hemodialysis? So um, hemodialysis is a life-saving um, and safe elimination of waste product, yeah? However, we have to understand just now. Earlier um, uh, in this course, we have identified function of the kidney, isn't it? And remember, the function of kidney is not just limited to the you know, um, excretion of the urine, uh, elimination of waste product also, but only, but it also has some other uh, function. Yeah, by having HD, of course, that will actually uh, taking some part of uh, eliminating waste product, but not other function of the kidney. Yeah, uh, and we have to understand. Uh, in, in fact, when patient on HD hemodialysis, uh, they are still having uh, some issues with other um, kidney function that are not being replaced by HD. Okay, so HD. In HD uh, treatment, yeah, what are the advantages? Um, so this is actually done 
by health professional at their dialysis centers. So any issues with their condition uh, while doing the dialysis, so the doctors and also the nurses can actually attend to them straight away. And of course, there are a lot of contact with uh, other people. Yeah, uh, a lot of emotional support because you know patients sit next to each other in the dialysis centers, so they can talk to each other and mm. something like that. But of course, there are some disadvantage. The disadvantage is that because they have to travel to the dialysis center, like um, the average or standard type of treatment is a three time weekly. Yeah, every time uh, of the dialysis dialysis session is four hours. So uh, by the end of the session, you're going to feel tired. So this is affecting, especially the adults who is working, yeah? Because, you know, they have to spend time at the dialysis centers and yet they have to go to work and so on, yeah? Um, and there are some other type of HD, we call, we call it intermittent HD, short daily HD, and nocturnal HD. Nocturnal HD is uh, entirely doing at night, so that will actually help for working adults. And of, of course, uh, continuous renal replacement therapy, this is actually meant for AKI, yeah? Um, so they are CHD, CHF, and so on. You can read uh, about this later on. Uh, we're going to need to go uh, pretty quick. Right. Okay. So um, this is uh, the one that I refer, uh, mentioned just now. Uh, this is the dialyzer, the important unit that actually replace uh, some of the function of the kidney. Um, um, so this is the dialysis machine, and the patient have to actually create the atrial vas, atrial uh, atrial venous uh, fistula, yeah, AV fistula in order uh, for, for us to access uh, the blood circulation system of the patient, right? So moving, in, uh, moving on is the peritoneal dialysis. Yeah? Peritoneal dialysis is also become more common um, in uh, Southeast Asia, particularly. Uh, in fact, when you look into certain countries such as Hong Kong, peritoneal dialysis is more uh, prevalence than hemodialysis in fact yeah more people are on pd rather than hd okay the most common type of peritoneal dialysis is called as continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis or capd this is basically using the okay this is basically you uh, are using the gravity you actually put the dialysate solution into your peritoneum cavity okay and our peritoneal membrane is at as semi permeable membrane, so it's actually act as like a kidney. Okay, mm -hmm. um, so um, once we infuse the dialysate solution, it's create the oncotic pressure and it's draw fluids, draw waste material, and we're going to drain back this uh, fluid, right? So there are um, when uh, if you are a practitioner, there are several type of bag available. Yeah, one liter, two liter bag, and so on. Two liter bag is uh, the most common one being used uh, by the patient. Uh, the numbers of or the little type of bag is actually depend on the patient size per se. Yeah? If the bigger patient uh, in general have, would need to, have, to infuse a lot more uh, fluid uh, or uh, dialysis into their peritoneal cavity. Okay? And the bag itself have a different type of concentration, 1.5%, 2.5%, and 4.25%. For dietitian, for dietitian or future dietitian, it's important to understand that when you infuse this dialysate solution into your peritoneal cavity, some of it, yeah, because this dialysate solution is comprised of dextrose, yeah. And you know that dextrose provide calories. So some of it will be absorbed. Yeah, about 60 to 70% of it will be absorbed. So when you try to, you know, for example, you try to uh, do some intervention to this patient, you have to take account for the absorbed uh, dextrose or calorie from this uh, dialysis solution. Okay. So there are several types of peritoneal. Uh, or PD, yeah. Uh, the, to name uh, some, CAPD is the most common one, yeah. Uh, so they have like um, they have to do this four to five times in a day, yeah. Uh, and then the other one that are less common and 
more expensive because they would require some uh, equipment to perform it, is such as APD, automated peritoneal dialysis, uh, CCPD, and so on, and IPD. So they, they need to use a machine to infuse the dialysis solution while they are sleeping at home at night, right? So uh, this is how the in terms of anatomy, how do we in how we do we infuse the dialysis solution into the peritoneal cavity? So uh, they have to put the tube or uh, catheter in here. Yeah. And this is the CCPD just now. They use the machine to infuse the dialysis solution. But for CAPD, we just use the gravity. Okay. We just hang the the, the uh, um, uh, dialysis solution to put it into our peritoneal cavity. Okay. So what are the advantage and disadvantage of PD? So as as you can as, as you can think of, yeah, because uh, PD um, for younger adults who is walking is a perfect for them because you know they can uh, they, they don't need to travel to dialysis centers. They can put it. Uh, they can do the exchange at the office and so on. Yeah, and uh, there's no vascular access. And uh, because they are doing this four to five times in a day, as opposed to three times in a week in HD, yeah, they have fewer uh, dietary restrictions in, in that sense. Yeah? Um, however, there are some disadvantages. This is particularly important, for example, for diabetic patients. Yeah, for diabetic patients, you know that they also need to control the sugars. Yeah? And because from dialysis, it's also containing some amount of sugars that are being absorbed. So they have to actually uh, control their overall carbohydrate intake as well. Yeah. Uh, and of course, there are some risks of abdominal hernia. And many patients, in fact, when they infuse a two liter fluid inside the peritoneal cavity, they feel full you know, because it's actually compressing their uh, stomach. Yeah. So, um, and then they, they, don't, they don't eat uh, as uh, much as they need to eat, right? Okay, I want to test some of your, uh, you know, uh, knowledge. How do you calculate this? Okay, let's try to calculate this, okay? Um, Mr. T are having, okay, let's uh, uh, get your calculator ready. Okay, Mr. T, are having four cycles of CAPD and each cycle has four hour duels. He used two liter dialysate with 2.5% concentration in the Sorry. Okay, continue with by the two liter dialysate with 1.5% in the afternoon and evening and one liter dialysate with 4.25% at night. Okay, so there are four altogether morning, afternoon, evening, and also at night, okay? But with a varying percentage uh, of the dextrose, okay? And we know that one gram of dextrose provides 3.4 calorie, and assuming about 60% of the dextrose, uh, uh, of the uh, dialysate infusion will be absorbed, how much calorie is actually um, provided by this dialysate? Can you complete? How much calorie is uh, okay? Maybe I can share this. Okay, I have uh, helped to calculate for you. Can you um, uh, join it uh, or identify it? how much calorie being absorbed from Mr. T just now? Dialysate of Mr. T just now. Okay. Can you respond it? into your menti.com. What is the calorie absorbed from peritoneal dialysis of Mr. T? Hmm. 
susah ya. <laughs> Madam uh, Chairman, Josephine, would you be able to get the answer? All right, okay, there are someone not really answering. All right, uh, seems like May, I would say it seems like majority is answering as 311 uh, KKL safely. Yeah? Uh, let's see whether this is correct. Okay. So these are the calorie absorbed from the peritoneal lizard. We have 2 liter, 2.5% morning, 2 liter, 1.5% afternoon, 1.5% evening, and 1 liter at night, but with much higher concentration, right? So to calculate it, right? So uh, 2 liter of 2.5%, meaning that there is 25 gram of dextrose in that 1 liter, isn't it? So your time was 2. And then you time with the calorie, 3.4 uh, calorie. So it's actually 170 kcal, yeah? And then you time with a 60% absorption, which is 102 kcal, right? And then you uh, you total up everything. So that would be 311 kcal per day, okay? So congratulations, most of you got it correct. All right. So now we are moving into the AKI, just slightly about AKI, yeah. So what is AKI? AKI is a very sudden uh, condition that's affecting the kidney, yeah. And then uh, this is uh, based on the definition by KDGO, yeah. Um, AKI is diagnosed when there are increase in serum creatinine, yeah. Suddenly, uh, within that, um, just few hours, yeah, 20, 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. And then uh, you can see that uh, they also can be stratified in two stages, yeah, stage one, two, and three. Uh, stage one is the case that uh, there is a 1.5 to 1.9 uh, time increase in the base uh, from the baseline serum creatinine. And the baseline that you, we are using is the lower serum creatinine yeah, uh, within a three month of event. So on top of that, we also look at the urine output. Urine output in this patient, yeah, they suddenly don't urinate. Yeah, uh, they urinate less than uh, five ml, uh, 0 0.5 ml per kilogram per hour within that uh, six to 12 hours, yeah. So this, uh, there are many factors though affecting AKI. For example, severe dehydration can also lead to AKI and so on. There are some uh, infection that can also lead to AKI. But it is not um, within the scope of this lecture to discuss further about it, yeah, because you want to focus on scaling. So, medical management, uh, AKI basically involves uh, mostly medical management, but there are some uh, nutrition components that are also important. Uh, basically, as a dietitian, our role is uh, to provide the adequate nutrition, yeah. Uh, we want to prevent uh, protein age wasting. We want to promote the tissue repair, especially for those who are having uh, infection. We want to support the immune uh, system. And uh, of course, uh, transition uh, nutrition support is also important. And uh, more importantly, you have to look into the hypo and hyperglycemia, hypertraglycemia that is uh, being experienced by uh, AKI patients. There are uh, dedicated guidelines to deal with AKI patient, which is not in the scope of this uh, lecture, just for your information, all right? So now we're going to move into our main thing, which is the medical nutrition therapy um, for CKD, all right? 
So, uh, so MNT for CKD, uh, if you look, you are referring to this KDOKI guideline, yeah, uh, it can be divided into several categories. They are based on nutrition assessment, based on medical nutrition therapy, based on protein energy intake recommendation, and also nutritional supp supplementation uh, as, as a general. Basically, on this guideline, there are about uh, 85 or more than 80 uh, recommendation yeah? uh, about each of the aspect from the nutrition assessment until intervention um, of uh, the CKD patient. But before we go further, I think it's very uh, uh, important and prudent for us to understand how they come up with this guideline in the first place. Yeah? Uh, as any other guideline, they have the quite the great the evidence, yeah. Uh, what evidence that we analyze, uh, from, uh, whatever evidence that they actually got and put into the guidelines, they grade it into A, B, C, and D. In A, evidence that means that they are very confident that um, the uh, you know uh, there is a true effect, yeah. But in D they have very little confidence about the uh, you know, uh, effect estimate or, or the true effect of uh, the evidence per se. And then they also have this in which they uh, classify the recommendation or the suggestion based on level one or level two, right? Level one based on the keyword of we recommend, level two we suggest, yeah? Uh, it's important for us to look for, uh, as a clinician, uh, what does it mean by level one recommendation? Level one meaning that most individual should receive the recommended course of action. Yeah. Um, and uh, adherence to this recommendation, uh, according to the guideline, should be used as a quality criterion. So level one is uh, the uh, highest sort of recommendation. Okay. And... Uh, also, uh, another note is that uh, it's also important uh, to understand for the evidence that they are using in this guideline is actually based on uh, from 1985 to 2017, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So from 2017 until 2021, there are more and more research or more data coming up, but those were not actually counted in this guideline. So bear that in mind. Yeah. Uh, and also interesting that when you look into the guideline, 85 recommendation that they provide in this guideline, about 50% of the recommendation is actually based on opinion. Opinion of who? Opinion of uh, those experts that are actually Ikizler, uh, Professor Ikizler and team that are actually coming out with this guideline, right? So uh, in terms of nutritional assessment, uh, what we want to know in terms of the you know, frequency, um, how frequent uh, uh, we have to do the body weight and also BMI and body composition assessment. Yeah? So in this guideline, they are saying you have to actually do it uh, for CKD 1 to 3 every 6 months. And as you progress further uh, in your CKD course, you have to do uh, every three months, yeah? And of course, for those who are uh, CKD5D, meaning that for HD and PD, you have to do it on every month. You have to do this assessment on every month for anthropometric data. So, and in this uh, guideline, they also highlight about metabolically uh, stable. So, so what does it mean by metabolically stable patient? Metabolically stable, meaning that a patient that absence of any active inflammations or for infectious disease or not being hospitalized in, in the last two weeks, you know, absent of poorly controlled diabetes. That's a very important keyword, yeah? Uh, so meaning that diabetes is fairly being controlled, yeah? And then there are some other comorbid such as uh, present cancer, uh, taken any immunosuppressive medication. These are not metabolically stable type of patient. So they are not actually bounded to this guideline, right? So what are the methods for us to use to measure the body weight and body composition for this patient? Yeah, 
so as I can, uh, we can see from this guideline, they are recommending to use uh, multi-frequency BIA for HD patient. This is 2C, level 2C, yeah, level 2 guideline, meaning that they're just suggesting for us to use it. Uh, and uh, the opinion is to use the S, the, the uh, Dex, Dextra, sorry, uh, Dexa, yeah. Uh, this is, um, uh, of course, it's expensive to do a Dexa, yeah. Uh, and it's just based on the opinion, okay. In terms of the um, nutritional, uh, other nutritional assessment, yeah. Uh, in adult with CKD 1 to 5B or post transplantation, BMI alone is not sufficient to establish or diagnose protein energy wasting unless the BMI is very low. So I'm glad that coming up with this guideline. So, it's, ladies and gentlemen, or fellow dietitians, it's very important when you look at CKD patient, you just don't look at the BMI per se. Yeah, you have to look into the composite index of nutritional status to identify whether uh, the patient have issues with protein energy wasting or nutritional issues and so on. Yeah. Um, right. So um, rather than the, uh, the indicator for nutritional status, but instead uh, BMI is also a predictor for mortality. So you can see here if the patient started their, yeah, you know, um, dialysis treatment with this being underweight, uh, it is uh, very likely that uh, you know uh, they don't have a long, um, you know, uh, duration that they can actually sustain on that particular treatment. So it's very important to prime our patient before they go to PD. You want to maintain as good nutritional status as possible before they go to PD or HD. All right. Um, so in this guideline, they also uh, do some uh, suggest on the composite nutritional indices. Yeah, they have two suggestions here to use the seven point SDA and also MIS malnutrition inflammation score. Uh, I hope that uh, you know uh, about these two composite nutritional indices here uh, for people with uh, CKD, yeah, they, they recommend using uh, seven point SGA and for CKD 5D on HD, yeah, they recommend using the MIS, yeah. So this is the S seven point SGA and also the MIS. So what are this about? So this is, uh, we are using this to screen our patient for their nutritional status. Okay, uh, so you can actually look into uh, further into this uh, tool and try to use it and uh, apply it in your practice. Okay, so based on the literature, it has been found that yeah, uh, based uh, on MIS, have pretty much linked into the survival of the patient. If the patient at the beginning or at the baseline, you assess them, they are uh, is actually showing a very poor score of MIS here. Yeah? Uh, so it is very likely that they cannot sustain in the treatment, yeah. Uh, meaning that they're going to die uh, pretty soon. Okay. So uh, just don't want to recap just now about the ISRNM criteria for protein energy wasting that we are just uh, mentioned just now. So there are four different criteria based on body mass, serum chemistry, muscle mass, and also dietary intake. So for us, in order for us to die, as a dietitian, for us to diagnose whether our patient having protein energy wasting, we have to assess all of these. Yeah, if any three of these satisfy, uh, uh, I mean, in the, um, for example, if they are having uh, BMI less than 23, if they're having uh, albumin less than 3.8, and then in terms of their intake, their calorie intake is less than 25 kcal per kilogram uh, body weight, they can be considered or already been diagnosed as PEW, yeah? Right, so this was published in 2008 and it has been used widely worldwide uh, among renal dietitians. 
uh, as a tool for us to diagnose whether someone having PEW or not. However, ladies and gentlemen, it is very, very interesting to see that in the latest guideline, in the KDOKI 2020 guideline, they do not include this one as part of the diagnostic criteria for PEW. You know, so this is something for us to ponder why is that the case, yeah? Um, and then when we do some literature search, why is that the case, yeah? Uh, and there are a lot of literatures coming up, a more recent literature coming up regarding the criteria, the ISRM criteria itself. And they found that the criteria is actually um, uh, not really uh, correlate with the clinical endpoint for uh, this patient. So the clinical endpoint will be uh, the mortality, you know, um, uh, the progress on SCAD and so on. So those are clinical endpoint. Yeah. Uh, so so that's kind of interesting why uh, that is uh, the case here. Yeah? And in fact, uh, some of these from Japanese study found that, you know, that BMI less than 23, 23 is pretty high for Asian standard. It's probably have to be lowered down and so on. Yeah. So there are some argument about the conclus conclusiveness of the evidence to support the use of the BEW diagnostic criteria proposed by ISRM. Just bear that in mind. Yeah, we can still use those uh, PW diagnostic criteria anyway. Yeah. So on, on, on other note, in terms of the biochemical data, uh, the guideline also highlighted that we cannot use the single um, single point, not single point, uh, single uh, measurements, uh, single biomarkers which is basically uh, we tend to use uh, serum albumin in this case here yeah, as a marker of nutrition status for this patient. Yeah? Instead, we have to consider a panel of uh, biomarkers in order to see or to gauge uh, what, would, what is the nutrition status of our patient. Okay. So in terms of uh, dietary intake, so what are the tools for us to assess dietary intake yeah, for CKD patient? So they suggest to use a three-day uh, food record as a preferred met method. So this is 2C evidence. Yeah. Uh, so in, uh, however, we can also use the alternative method. This is based on opinion, such as uh, FFQ, NPCR. What is NPCR? Yeah, normalized protein catabolic rate. This is actually derived from a very uh, complicated formula. So what you need to calculate NPCR is that you need to know the um, blood urea nitrogen of the patient. Yeah, uh, and then you can plug in into the formula. This is uh, available uh, online. You can just type NPCR formula, just uh, put in the, uh, calculate your, the data of your patient to try to calculate it. So what it means is that it's actually reflecting the intake of the protein of the patient, right? So that is an alternative method that you can use to assess dietary intake of your patient, right? Um, so in terms of uh, assessing energy requirement uh, among metabolically stable patients, uh, of course, the, the best is to measure using indirect uh, calorimetry. But of course, uh, this is very expensive uh, uh, equipment um, to assess this. Uh, we do have it in our hospital, in Hospital Penaja, UPM. Uh, uh, to, uh, but in order for us to apply it to all patients, it's uh, pretty expensive in terms of the consumables that we're going to use it. Yeah, uh, so uh, so that have to come uh, cost is is uh, is matter as well. Uh, so you have to consider that. So in the case that you know you don't have uh, IC in direct calorimetry, you can use um, you know a uh, disease specific uh, predictive energy equation. Yeah, uh, what are those disease specific predictive energy equation? This is um, based on this guideline. 
So there are two types of uh, specific formula in order for us to calculate the energy requirement for CKD patient. Uh, you can use from Villar et al. and also Biome uh, Gray et al. Yeah. So you need to plug in data about the age, the in a uh, year, height of the patient in the centimeter, uh, and also uh, body weight of the patient in terms of the kilogram. And then you have to uh, adjust it to the factor age, right? For example, if the patient age is more than 65, then you're going to uh, uh, put it as zero. If uh, the patient gender is female, then you're going to put as zero, okay? And from there, you can actually get the resting energy expenditure for your patient, yeah? Uh, you can compare this with um, the patient intake later on. Of course, uh, CKD patient in the hospital setting is not just come with CKD. This is probably the admitted due to some other reason, you know, probably having fra fractures, or probably they having a sepsis or some uh, motor vehicle accident. So you have to adjust the need <laughs> Yeah. Right. So, in terms of providing medical nutrition therapy, who should provide the medical nutrition therapy? So, based on the guideline by uh, Kidoki Guideline 2020, they recommend a registered dietitian, but not working lo alone, but we have to collaborate with our physician and other healthcare prov uh, providers such as nurses, physician assistant in providing MNT. But, but dietitians play a major role in providing MNT for a uh, kidney patient. I think this is going to be a, a very challenging situation, particularly in Asian and also Southeast Asian country in which we don't really have a, 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 you know, a, a dietitian specialization uh, program uh, established uh, as yet, yeah. And in fact, uh, when we look into uh, our scenario in Malaysia, for example, uh, it's very few uh, people can be considered as renal dietitian. Uh, so as a result, uh, we only have a generalist dietitian that see everybody. So they can't really focus or concentrate uh, to the kidney patient, yeah. Um, and uh, okay, uh, and also it's, it's interesting. Yeah, they also uh, said something about the telehealth. Yeah, tele consultation. So this is also can be uh, done uh, efficiently. And in fact, due to the pandemic, uh, COVID nineteen, uh, we have started to implement this uh, in our hospital as well. And I'm sure that is also the same in Indonesia, right? So this is the prescription of uh, nutrition prescription summary. Yeah, uh, you can refer to the, I have shared uh, the slide with you, you can always refer to it later. Um, so uh, based on CKD 3.5 and also CKD 5D, all right? Uh, what are the protein requirement, energy, uh, and also micronutrients requirement? We're going to go uh, slightly, uh, I have, uh, more minutes. Uh, we have to go um, uh, from nutrients to nutrient. Okay. Regarding protein intake. Okay. This is where uh, there is quite a, a, a big difference between uh, the current guideline and the previous guideline. Okay. Uh, so in the current guideline, so uh, the guideline for CKD 3 to 5. All right, CKD three to five. If you have no diabetes, is uh, the recommended intake is between 0 0.55 to 0 0.6 gram per kilogram body weight. Yeah, and then if the keto analog option is available, yeah, it's also you can also use uh much you can provide much lower protein to your patient. Yeah, 0 0.28 to 0 0.43 gram per kilogram body weight. Yeah. But if the patient is having diabetes, yeah, the recommendation is between 0 0.6 to 0.8 gram per kilogram per day. Why is that so? Why uh, diabetes patients got to give slightly, you know, more liberal protein intake uh, than non-diabetes patient? So we know that in diabetes patient, one of the important aspects to prevent them to from further progressing in your CKD course 
is to control their uh, blood sugar or having a good glycemic control, in other words. Yeah? So in order for us to have a good glycemic control, so we have to also adjust the proportion of carbohydrate when you plan their menus in it. So it's very, very difficult to actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, plan a good proportion of carbohydrate if the protein is very low. Yeah, if for example, if protein is 0.5, you're going, you have to increase somewhere and then you end up increasing in carbohydrate, isn't it? So when you increase the carbohydrate, it's, it's, it's rather challenging to adjust the uh, you know, control of the blood sugar for the patient, uh, right? So that's one of the uh, reason why they put a slightly higher protein allocation for diabetic patient. And then for those uh, CKD5D, which is on PD and also HD, the recommendation is between 1 to 1.2 gram per kilogram body weight. Can you, can you recognize the difference? The difference is that in, in um, K-Doki guideline in the year 2000, or you, if you refer to your Indonesian guideline, so the recommendation for MHD is for, for 1.2. They put that, like a strict 1.2 gram per kilogram body weight. Yeah? For PD, the recommendation is between 1.2 to 1.3 gram per kilogram uh, body weight. Yeah. So right now they are actually giving some uh, leeway, some uh, range in which you can actually make uh, or provide the protein for this uh, type of patient. It, it makes no sense though, in the reason in in if you can. Uh, for for the practitioners out there, if you can agree with me, that uh, most of the time it's actually very uh, difficult for our patient to actually uh, meeting the guideline anyway because they don't eat um, that much, right? Okay, so this is something, uh, you know, something that for us to think about, about this recommendation from k key guideline. Okay, as I mentioned just now, um, in my earlier um, uh, lecture about this uh, guideline, the guideline is it is not is guideline is just for us is just a document to guide uh, practitioners like us, yeah, in providing the nutrition care for our patient. But in certain cases and circumstances, we are not really. Um, you know, uh, bound or uh, you need to abide to the guideline anyway, yeah, because you have to consider the patient situation uh, that may not be appropriate for you to follow it because uh, what comes first is your clinical judgment, right? So this is something for us to, to ponder, yeah? So this paper is actually published, uh, I think it's not a case level, but uh, some I quote it uh, wrongly. This is a Cochrane review paper that was uh, published quite recently in 2020, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So this uh, review is actually in contrast to what is being recommended in KDOKI guideline in the year uh, 2020. Yeah. If you can see, this is what we call as a forest plot, right? In this review, they review uh, many, many studies, yeah, many, many studies, and they end up coming up with the total effect, yeah, whether low protein diet will confer any benefit in, you know, uh, changes in terms of GFR. Remember just now, the reason why we provide or we prescribe low protein diet for our CKD patient is to delay the progression towards end-stage kidney disease, isn't it? So that is our ultimate aim, why we provide low protein diet in the first place. So let's take a look at this evidence. So based on the evidence that they analyzed, yeah, based on some of landmark study, they found that uh, here, there's no evidence. There's no evidence to support low protein diet provision to um, CKD in order for us to delay the progression to uh, end-stage kidney disease. Very interesting. And in second analysis, wait, is that all? Oh, it seems it doesn't work. 
uh, okay. There are several other uh, analysis, this is analysis 1.3, in terms of the changes in GFR, they also look into, if I'm not mistaken, into the uh, some other clinical endpoints, such as mortality, uh, and, uh, and also, and also uh, sorry, mortality, and what is the other one? I cannot remember. Let me check. Okay, uh, development of end-stage kidney disease, and this one is mortality, so three things. Mortality, end stage kidney disease, and also a progression of the GFR, all are consistently showing that um, low protein diet does not really support uh, that clinical endpoint. Yeah, so that's something for us to ponder. Anyway, uh, but bear in mind the difference between this guideline. And also the Cochrane review just now that I showed to you is in terms of what kind of study that actually they put into their review, right? Uh, remember for KDOKI guideline, they include the study from 1985 to 2017, whereby in the Cochrane guideline, they include much earlier study, which includes some of the quite landmark studies such as MD MDRD study, yeah? So that's made different anyway in terms of uh, you know uh, the benefit of uh, low protein diet to uh, the progression of CKD. Okay. Uh, so another aspect is on the use of keto analogs. I know that I'm not sure. Maybe later you can share with us, or probably next week you can share with us on uh, you know the the practice of using keto analogs. Um, in the treatment or uh, on the management of CKD patient. For us uh, in Malaysia, there are some uh, few hospitals that are actually using this uh, as sort of treatment for the patient, and, but not my hospital. Uh, the reason being is because uh, it, it is uh, rather expensive for the patient here, yeah? uh, because we have to heavily subsidize the patient here, yeah, the cost of keto analog is uh, rather expensive, yeah? So this is some example of common keto analogs, yeah? Um, why, what, what do we mean by keto analog? Keto analog see, here is actually, is lacking the amino group that bound to the alpha carbon of amino acid. So because of that, they can be converted to their respective amino acid without additional need of nitrogen. So that's the advantage of uh, keto analog, yeah? Um, so what type of protein? So just now we're already talking about how much protein we should give for CKD patient. Now it's what type of protein, right? Does, does it make a difference? So if you remember, yeah, uh, based on um, uh, Indonesian uh, guideline just now and also Malaysian guideline, uh, our previous guideline was saying about, you know, 50% HBV, 50% of the protein that we provide for CKD patient must be HBV, high biological value, which is basically referring to the animal-based uh, sort of protein. Yeah? Interestingly, interestingly, in this guideline, uh, the, uh, the evidence is there is insufficient evidence. Insufficient evidence means there is in evidence. Yeah? There's in insufficient evidence to recommend any particular type of protein, be it uh, plant or animal-based, in terms of effect of nutritional status, calcium or phosphorus level in CKD1 to 5D patient. This is level 1B evidence, yeah? It's quite high evidence, level 1B. So uh, meaning that for now on, we, we're not longer, we don't longer need to actually emphasize on having HBV for this type of patient, yeah? Uh, what more important is the uh, total uh, amount of protein for the patient. Okay, so how about energy intake? Yeah, so energy intake for CKD1 to 5D and also post transplantation, yeah, should be between 25 to 35 kcal per kilogram body weight. And of course, this is uh, different than the previous guideline. If in the previous guideline, uh, if you remember, yeah, if you are CKD and that CKD3, uh, for example, 
and then uh, your age is less than 60 years old, so your requirement would be 35 kcal per kilogram body weight, you know. Uh, in reality, it's very, very difficult to reach that 35 kcal per kilogram body weight, especially when the patient is already exhibiting the sign and symptom of urinia, you know, having uh, poor appetite, having um, uh, altered taste, for us to force the patient to eat up to 35 kcal per kilogram body weight. I think this is a good move, yeah, um, so that we can only achieve this between 25 there's some uh, leeway or range that we can actually uh, achieve for our patient, 25 to 35 kcal, all right? So moving on, let me check the time. Um, uh, almost, okay. Um, can I proceed? Uh, yes. Uh, Dr. Sufitri, um, maybe five up to ten more minutes. Please. All right, okay. I'll uh, proceed, okay? Okay. Uh, so, there are, these are recommendations for micronutrients. Yeah, maybe I can just uh, summarize it. Yeah. In terms of phosphorus, potassium, and also sodium. If you remember, in the previous guideline, here yeah, in CKD, uh, sorry, KDOKI 2000, they, they provide the specific range of recommendation. For example, for phosphorus between 800 to 1000 milligram in a day. Yeah. But in the current guideline, there is no more provision of that specific uh, amount of, of phosphorus that should be achieved by this patient. Instead, we only adjust our phosphorus or phosphorus of the patient intake based on their serum phosphate level. Yeah, if their serum phosphate level is, you know, uh, elevated, so you adjust accordingly. Yeah, and it's more important to actually looking into the bioavailability of the uh, phosphate sources. One milligram of phosphate is not just one milligram because you have to consider the bioavailability. Yeah, I could, I have a few more slides about phosphate. So this is some of the um uh education tools that we can actually use to educate our patient about phosphate. So this is the bioavailability of the phosphate just now that I'm just saying to you, okay? If the food intake is predominantly coming the, from the processed food, as you can see here, uh, maybe this processed food doesn't have much phosphorus, but whatever available in there, it's called as, as in organic phosphorus available in there is being absorbed 90 to 100 percent of it will be absorbed. But if the patient intake of phosphorus is predominantly coming from the fruits and vegetables, yeah, the absorption is only 10 to 30 percent. Yeah, so do, you have to consider this absorption rate as well. Yeah. Uh, in nature, though, we use uh, the still we use the traffic light system. This is quite old system, uh, and we still found that it's somehow it's still working for our patient. So we provide a list of uh, you know typical food item, and then uh, what are the amount of carbohydrate? What is uh, what what does it mean by yellow, green, and red here? Um, red doesn't mean it's very important to emphasize. Red doesn't mean that you cannot eat. You can eat as long as within a day, you don't eat more than 10 red dough. Okay, so you count your diet in a, uh, in a day. If it's not no longer than uh, 10 red dough, so you can actually eat it, eat it. Okay, but in view of the current guideline in CKL, uh, Kiroki 2020, you know, it's interesting that uh, the adjustment of phosphorus can only be, uh, should only be made when there is elevation, elevated uh, blood phosphate uh, level, all right? Of course, in this uh, 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 guideline that we give to the patients, we also talk to them how they can actually further reduce uh, the amount of phosphorus, yeah? Uh, you can also see here, you know, we not just include the amount of phosphorus, but we also include uh, the potassium as well. Some of this food, for example, uh, maybe it's low in phosphorus, but also high in uh, potassium, which is indicated by this heart sound, heart uh, symbol. And we provide them example. So this is the typical 
uh, daily menu, you know, uh, providing 15 dots, break dots altogether. But uh, with the modified menu, uh, we can, uh, they can uh, consume the amount of, uh, of phosphate within a, you know, a reasonable range. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we also teach them. It's very important uh, to teach them about phosphate binders. Yeah, among CKD five D, they have to take. Uh, many of them have to take phosphate binders when they actually need to take it and how much they need to take it. They have to understand it based on the diet that they are actually taking, right? Uh, so for example, if they are taking breakfast with only one slice of bread with uh, margarine, so that doesn't really provide. Uh, you know. Uh, quite significant amount of phosphate. So they don't really need to take with their phosphate binders, right? Okay, so that is phosphate. The same goes with potassium. In the current recommendation, they don't really, um, they don't really uh, identify or mention the exact amount of potassium that has to be, need to be taken, but rather it has to be adjusted according to the serum potassium of the patient, right? And uh, in, in Malaysia, um, of course, our, our education uh, material is slightly outdated. We're still using or dividing this uh, based on the potassium content, whether it is low, high, or mid, uh, medium. And then uh, we suggest our patient to limit those who is high yeah, uh, potassium content. Why we need to uh, restrict the potassium to my uh, fellow student is because uh, we, we know that uh, if we don't if the patient having hyperkalemia, meaning that elevated blood uh, potassium level, that can actually cause the tachycardia, cardiac arrest, and so on. Yeah, and this is very important to the practitioners, to the uh, my dietitian. Bear in mind that uh, diet is not the only thing providing potassium for our patient. Most of the time, though, you know, from my experience is that uh, when patients have elevated blood potassium, it's not necessarily from diet. It can be from some other thing. Yeah? For example, um, GI bleed, acidosis, uh, some uh, usage of certain uh, type of medication, this can also lead to the high potassium level. So it's very important to, to put your uh, perspective uh, broader when you review the potassium level of your patient, right? Of course, uh, potassium, how do we deal with it? Uh, some type of treatment, such as uh, when you cut uh, the potassium uh, into a smaller pieces, when you boil them, you blanch them, all of these will actually reduce uh, the number, the amount of potassium in the food particular item. Yeah? You can actually refer to this uh, particular slide. You, know, you can see that some um, reduction up to 50% when we actually boil the potato. All right? So of course, you have to remove that fluid. Yeah. All right. Uh, sodium. Um, is it? Okay. And then uh, we have uh, come into recommendation about the sodium. Sodium recommendation just now. Where is it? Okay. Sodium recommendation just now for steady three to five. Uh, they recommend less than 2.3. This is uh, inherent with the television recommendation in a way. Yeah. Uh, it's important. Uh, they identify that it's important for sodium uh, to control the sodium in order to control the blood pressure of the patient as well. Yeah. And, and also volume control. Yeah. Right. And of course, uh, in... Uh, I think uh, our food culture is pretty much uh, similar that you can relate to. Yeah, uh, in our country, one more, one of the most important thing is not the sodium being added at the table, yeah, at the dining table, but rather some other condiments being added, and all of these condiments are actually very high in potassium. For example, uh, sorry, very high in sodium. For example. Uh, sambal belacan, we have to have a belacan here, budu is actually a fish sauce, yeah, uh, and then also kicap, kicap is a soy sauce, uh, sauce chili, and all this being added uh, either during the cooking or also after the cooking, 
yeah, when uh, people or when patient want to eat it. So uh, you have to look upon into all of this uh, when you do the assessment of your patient, right? How about some micronutrients, uh, other micronutrient recommendations such as vitamin C, vitamin D. This is quite uh, straightforward. Yeah. Uh, what I can say is that there are no um, uh, uh, a strong evidence to support any of this uh, supplementation except for certain type of vitamins such as uh, vitamin C. Uh, so it's reasonable to look uh, at least patient to meet the RDA. Uh, yeah, uh, eating, eating sufficiently, yeah. Um, and then if it's inadequate, that recommend uh, to supplement up to the RDA level, yeah. Uh, so they are also provide the recommendation about uh, ONS, you know, Ronald. Um, so if I can summarize this in one slide, yeah. So uh, as you know, many of the uh, CKD patients, you know, uh, having issues with their protein energy wasting. So you have to try this from step to step, from a uh, step to step basis, uh, step by step basis here. Yeah? Uh, first, uh, you have to look uh, or provide nutrition counseling. And if that doesn't work, provide the oral nutrition uh, support, which is a CKD based um, or CKD specific formula uh, with a nutrition counseling. Uh, if that doesn't work, then you can try the tube feeding or enteral nutrition. And then if that doesn't work, you can try the interdialectic uh, parenteral nutrition yeah, in between the dialysis. Yeah? Uh, and also, sorry, during the dialysis and also total parenteral nutrition. So that's how uh, it works for the nutritional supplementation. Okay. And also, uh, I think that's pretty much about it. I don't have much time. Uh, there are some special consideration that you have uh, to look upon and also think carefully about uh, your patient as well. Yeah? Uh, particularly, uh, we, did, we do also do investigation pertaining to the Ramadan uh, fasting practices. And we know that in CKD patients, uh, they are not really uh, recommended. They are at high risk category yeah? uh, in, uh, if they want to fast. But our study found that about 60 to 70% will fast anyway. Yeah? So it's very important to understand that it's not just from the perspective of us as a clinician, but perspective of the patient, why they fast in the first place. Yeah? Uh, so in order to, instead of just saying, no, you, know, you cannot fast, but rather we can accommodate, you know, uh, provide um, uh, proper dietary guidance before they actually fasting. Uh, I don't have time to uh, talk uh, more about it. If you are interested, you can read further on the link that I've provided, okay? And another special consideration that you have to consider when you deal or you provide uh, intervention for our patient, for skinny patient is that, they are high tendency for eating the same thing every single day, you know, because there are a lot of limitation, uh, a lot of restriction that this patient have to make, isn't it? So, so they end up eating the same type of food in every day. And the study have found that if they are doing that, uh, it is more likely that they are not going to meet their energy intake and protein requirement if they are eating the same type of food every day. So you have to make sure that your um advice to the patient include as much as food as possible instead of saying you cannot eat this and that tell them these are the things that you can actually eat yeah right um, uh, okay uh, that is more on dietary pattern I think that's pretty much it okay I'm done all right, thank you, uh, Dr. Sulfitri, for the wonderful insights to refute um, more about our understanding on medical nutrition therapy on front kidney disease patients. So there are several questions we already got on the chat box. Dr. Sulfitri, I will read through it for you. Um, the first one is regarding how we calculate the body weight to recommend protein intake for patients. Mm. Uh, do we use 
actual body weight or ideal body weight? And is there any different uh, recommendation for overweight or obese patients? Okay, very, very good question. Uh, I forgot to mention about body weight to calculate the uh, protein and also energy requirement here. Yeah? So uh, remember just now, uh, based on the reference that I showed to you here, yeah, uh, if you are looking into the NKF uh, guideline based on 2020, in the US, they use several, uh, they give several options to calculate the ideal body weight. Yeah? For example, you can use the uh, uh, Metropolitan Life Insurance table yeah, based on high and weight. Uh, you, you, you use uh, high and weight, and then you uh, see what, what will be the IBW for that particular patient. That is one thing. So another thing is you can use a Humvee method. In Humvee method, um, the IBW is calculated based on every hundred pound, every hundred pound, uh, for the uh, sorry, uh, hundred pound for the first five feet, and then every uh, inch you increase in your height. Yeah, uh, I think uh, you're familiar in the US are using this pretty uh, every uh, in five. Every uh, sorry, every inch increase in uh, height, then you are going to add five pound, yeah, five pound, and then you you have to convert into kilogram. So that's an, another thing. I, I think for for Southeast Asian, we're not really familiar with this. Uh, based on the Malaysian guideline, which I'm still using, what we are using how to calculate IBW is that um, we uh, if the patient is having uh, BMI less than twenty. You know, you calculate IBW at the BMI of 20. If the patient is having BMI more than 25, you calculate the IBW at the BMI of 25. But you understand that? So if the patient is having um, weight between BMI of 20 to 25, in between, we just use their actual weight in order to calculate their energy and also protein needs. Is that clear? So I, I think that is uh, the current uh, one that I'm actually practicing. Uh, but uh, uh, we at the Malaysian Dietitian Association, we're trying to review our current guideline. We're looking into more evidence. Uh, until now, uh, until then, then we're still using the same, uh, the one that I've actually told you, right? Is that clear? Yes, it's very clear. Dr. Zulfitri, thank you very much. So it depends on the um, body mass index for the patients. Yes. If it's between 20 and 25, we use the actual body weight. And if it's less than 20, we need to calculate it uh, for 20. And then if it's more than 25, we calculate the ideal body weight uh, for 25. Yes, correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, we will move on to the next question so there are two questions regarding the keto analog so the uh, the question is about how to calculate calculate a keto analog for patients on a very low protein diet and also um, this is from a practitioner so she shared about uh, it's often for patients uh, prescribed to use keto, keto analog uh, while the patient is still uh, consume enough food orally and often it's more than they need so do we still need to use the keto analog uh, or we like you know we can advise it to stop use the keto analog for these patients um, so i don't get the last the last one uh... the last one is if the patients um, still consume adequate um, food orally okay uh, do we still need to use or advise yeah, no. patients to use this keto analog? Mm. Okay, okay. Uh, this just a disclaimer. I'm not. Uh, I've uh, I've never had a chance to actually uh manage patient uh with keto analogs, but my friends uh my colleagues in some of the hospital that uh, does. Um, so uh, for me personally, I feel like uh, first you have to consider this keto analog is very expensive. But going back to the basic just now, yeah, uh, the reason why uh, we actually provide the keto analog to this patient uh, with a very low amount of protein in the first place is 
uh, to minimize the sign and symptom of uh, uremia and to, to delay the further progression of CKD yeah? um, in that sense. Uh, so you have to go back to this basic why you have to provide in the first place. So in your last question, you were saying that the patient is already eating adequately. Why would you actually need to supplement the patient with keto analog anyway? Yeah, uh, it's a, it's a amount of cost, and and of course, uh, if you supplement it, then uh, the protein will be uh excessive anyway. Yeah, so uh, best is if patient can intake is already achieving what uh he or her needs. His or her need, you don't really need to uh, supplement with keto anymore. But I'm going to KIV here yeah, uh, or put on this keto, uh, keto analog thingy uh, probably in that suite when we, we can actually have some time to discuss on uh, how do we calculate on it. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sulfitri. Okay, maybe yeah. we can move on to the next question uh, from the students. What is the best approach to manage nutrition intervention for patients who is pregnant women and suffered from CKD? So it's regarding the need to balance uh, their electrolyte and water requirement. Is it still need to restrict uh, water, in water intake or is there any other consideration okay. for it? to prevent dehydration and also the impact of the development of the fetus. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, this is a very uh, interesting case here. Yeah? Uh, pregnant and also having CKD. Yeah, of course, uh, we have to prioritize what this is come. The, uh, there's no, how do I say, there's no black and white. Uh, how do you actually manage on this case in the first place? Yeah, it comes to the back to the uh, nutritional status of the patient. What we should prioritize in this case, yeah. So, uh, if I personally, I would say uh, that you have to maintain the nutritional status of your particular patient and also the health of the babies, yeah. So that the baby uh grow um uh adequately, yeah. So make sure uh the patient uh eating sufficient amount of protein and uh us. Uh, uh, meeting the the uh, RNI uh, recommended nutrient intake for uh, for the pregnant women instead of following the uh, CKD patient, yeah. Uh, but you don't want to go uh, too high in terms of protein intake, yeah. Uh, again, uh, this there's no how do I say there's no uh, a straightforward way, uh, black uh, right and wrong way how to manage it. Uh, I guess you uh, and then question about you know uh, whether the patient would require fluid restriction and all that is depend depend on that particular situation yeah but what stage of the CKD is patient is already at is it at, at it's already at a stage five stage four uh, if it's stage five is uh, I'm sure that there will be medical interventions coming in uh, whether to put a patient on um, dialysis and so on. Uh, but if it's much earlier stage, at stage three, I think there is not uh, an issue in terms of uh, fluid intake as long as patients still uh, urinate. Yeah. Uh, so I guess um, what we could do is to have a more clearer uh, picture about the case uh, per se, and we can't really generalize um, the recommendation for a pregnant. A CKD patient to all. Okay. okay thank you, Dr. Zulfitri, uh, for, for the clarification. So we are back to the personalized and we have to prioritize the condition of the patient, especially for pregnancy. Uh -huh. And okay, the I think this is the last questions that we have. Um, okay, based on this experience in Indonesia, egg white are given uh, for hemodialysis patient to reduce phosphorus. How about the practice in Malaysia? Is there any other uh, food given to the patient other than egg white? Interesting. I would like to know more why um, egg white is given to reduce the phosphorus. Okay. 
Um, Mrs. Triani, can you confirm um, these questions? So, okay, I can see here, uh, can we hear in Indonesia, AOI are given to hemodialysis patient to reduce phosphorus. How about Indonesia? Maybe there are other than AOI. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm not aware. Uh, <laughs> how do I say? Uh, okay. If I can understand you uh, correctly, uh, yes, we when we recommend for patient with elevated phosph uh, phosphorus level, uh, in some of the patients, if in their diet, they, you know, they are heavy egg users. They, have, they, they, they eat uh, a lot of egg, yeah? nasi lemak, other eggs, uh, and then, and then uh, nasi goreng, other eggs, right? Uh, and of course, um, in, uh, you know that in egg yolk, uh, the phosphorus content, content uh, is much higher, yeah? in egg yolk as compared to the egg white. Yeah, uh, you could do that. But remember just now, uh, what more important, you have to look at overall dietary pattern of your patient and uh, consider, do consider the absorption rate. You know, uh, from the uh, animal sources, it's only 60 to 70% of the phosphate will be absorbed anyway. Yeah. If you can, uh, if you you have to align, okay, look at the phosph phosphorus uh, level in the blood. Is it too high? Uh, how high it is? And then look at the, what are the diet pattern? Yeah. What are the components in the diet actually contributing to the phosphate level? Is it predominantly coming from, you know, uh, eggs? A lot of eggs because eggs is cheap, I guess. So eating uh, every, everything is with egg. Uh, so, or if there are some other things, this could, could be probably coming from the uh, processed food, such as some patient uh, taking uh, tetare with a sweetened condensed milk. Now in sweetened condensed milk, there are uh, inorganic phosphate that are being uh, absorbed at much uh, higher rate, 100% for example. So my su suggestion is that, uh, how do I say? Um, uh, if I were you, I prefer not to be restrictive, but rather to look at the overall dietary pattern, and then how we can actually uh, replace some of the high phosphate food with the alternative uh food that is agreeable with the patient. Yeah. Uh, is that okay? Uh, and, and perhaps I can share with you uh on our uh phosphate guide uh, book to you uh, to look into the food list uh, using the uh, uh, traffic light system just now. Okay, thank you. So the better approach is to uh, how to manage high phosphorus level is to evaluate uh, the individualized or the patients about their diet pattern and then we see which, uh, which is the most contributing for the intake of the phosphorus, and then we will mm -hmm. recommend the uh, replacement or the alternative for them. Okay, um, unfortunately, because of our limited time we have today, um, we have to wrap up our session. Okay, so um thank you for all participants for the questions and thank you for dr Zulfitri for discussion um the key the key message that we can have today is we have to always remember that our mnt or medical nutrition therapy goals is to optimize nutritional status for our clients or patient and also to minimize the risk of complications with individualized uh, modifications needed Okay, hopefully that now all participants gain better understanding on this MNT for CKD uh, patients. Thank you once again for Dr. Sylvitri for the insightful lecture and discussions today. We will he hear more from Dr. Sylvitri on the next session uh, scheduled next week. And um, I personally apologize for any mistakes during the sessions and now I will give the time back to our MC, uh, Ma Umi. Thank you. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Zulfitri Azwan Matdaud, RBN, 
for the valuable presentation and also we also thank Ms. Anandati for moderating this session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we end this uh, program, we will have a photo session and the session will be guided by, by Mbak Nadira. Mbak Nadira, you there? Mbak Nadira, are you ready? Mbak Wait. Almira. Mbak Almira, you there? Mbak, Mbak Nadira. Yes, I think Nadira is ready. Okay, so okay. So uh, we will have three uh, times a photo shoot. Please turn on your camera. We are going to start our photo station. So um, the first screen, Mbak Nadira, siap ya? Satu, dua, tiga. Oke, okay, enough. So uh, the second uh, session. Satu, dua, tiga. Thank you. And the last, the last screen, satu, dua, tiga. Thank you so much. So ladies and gentlemen, now we have finally come to the end of our program. On behalf of the Department of Nutrition and Health of the Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing, Universitas Gajah Mada, we thank Dr. Zulfitri Azwan Madaud, RDN, and also we thank all the participants for joining us today. See you in the next meeting or the next event. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sampai ketemu lagi di Terima kasih. pertemuan pertemuan berikutnya. Next week, Dr. Azman. Terima kasih. Jumpa lagi ya. Iya, jumpa next week. Alright. Terima kasih.